Thank you so much, everybody, for joining and welcome to today's webinar, Aerial Survey Methods for Monitoring Seabird Populations. Um, today, we'll be discussing key considerations for surveying wildlife with drone technologies. And this is helping us to get ready for our 2023 Caribbean Regional Seabird Census. So just a little bit about our presenters today. We're very delighted to welcome two distinguished speakers. We have with us Serge uh, Witch and um, Rhiannon Austin. Serge is a professor at Liverpool, John Moore's University in the UK. His research interests are focused largely on primate behavioral ecology, tropical rainforest ecology, and conservation of primates and their habitats. Serge is one of the co-founders of Conservation Drones, which is an organization that seeks to share knowledge of building and using low-cost unmanned aerial vehicles for conservation research applications with conservation practitioners worldwide. He is also a lead researcher for a Caribbean AI, which aims to harness machine learning for various conservation projects, including those using drones. Recently, Serge has been teaming up with EPIC in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, as well as Grenada, to survey the bird populations. We also have with us Rhiannon Austin. Rhiannon is a research associate and conservation scientist at the University of Liverpool. Her interests focus in seabird ecology and understanding spatial behavior of mobile marine vertebrates. She uses a range of methods in her work, including bio logging, drones, acoustic monitoring, traditional survey methods, and statistical modeling techniques. Rhiannon is currently based in the Turks and Caicos Islands, where she manages a collaborative project with local organizations aimed at understanding local seabird populations, developing population monitoring programs, and strengthening conservation strategies and capacity. She's involved in a number of regional projects in the Caribbean that use movement data, from seabirds to understand biological connectivity between island ecosystems. Her recent research has focused largely on foraging behavior of boobies and frigate birds. So welcome, Serge and Rhiannon. Thank you so much for joining it, joining us and uh, turning it over to you. Thanks, Lisa, for the warm introduction and welcome, everybody. Um, it's a real pleasure to be talking to you today. And thank you for joining us. For those of you in the Caribbean during your lunch break, I know it's a busy work day for everybody, so we really appreciate it. Um, so we're going to drone on about drones to you for the next hour. Uh, as Lisa said, I'm Rhiannon. I'm a seabird ecologist. Um, I'm based in the Turks and Caicos Islands. I'm not a drone expert, um, as it's been advertised, but I do use drones a lot and drone data in my work. And um, we're really excited to have Serge here talking to us today because he is a drone expert and he's even written books on the subject. So I'm going to start off and I'm going to talk more generally about drones and why we're using them and why we're interested in using them for seabirds and conservation. And I'm going to get through that as quickly as possible so I can give Serge as much time as possible to talk about some of the work that he does, um, some of the ways that he he applies the data and analyzes the data once they've been collected. Um, so uh, without ado, I'm gonna start and let me just make sure that they can move on through the presentation. Okay, here we go. So I'm gonna start talking to you about drones, introduce them, tell you about the anatomy of the different types of drones that are available now on the market. Um, also why we want to survey them. And then I'm going to go on to speak about species and habitat suitability. So the question is, are drones a suitable method in your particular instance? Uh, and then we're going to run over quickly about the field survey uh, considerations that you have, including some safety and training considerations before I pass over to Serge. So drones are now being used increasingly. It's a very novel new technology, but they're being used increasingly for many, many applications in conservation and in ecology. I've listed some on the slide that you can see in front of you there. Uh, the first is to estimate abundance and distribution of wild animals. But on top of that, and that's what we're talking about mostly today, but on top of that, you have some very niche applications, such as locating animals that have radio tags on them. Uh, also to look at stress of animals in response to human activities 
And probably one of my favorite examples is a drone called the Snotbot, which is a drone which is used to collect DNA samples from whales when they come to the surface of the ocean and exhale. And those samples can tell scientists a lot about the genetic origins of the whales, can tell them about the health of individuals, and can even tell you if a whale's pregnant or not. So you can glean a huge wealth of information from using drones in your surveys. And then on top of just information for animals, you can also collect a lot of supplementary data streams and information on the surrounding habitat that animals choose to breed or migrate to. So we can do habitat mapping. We can learn about things like plastic pollution and the distribution of plastic in the oceans. Drones are now also being used in anti-poaching efforts, particularly in places um, like Africa, we have the large mammals that are at threat and even to monitor the spread of invasive species. So they're an incredibly powerful monitoring tool. Okay, so moving on, I've just showed you some of the, the, some photos of some drones here. There are a huge number of drones available on the market and they range in size and in their anatomy. So the three main types are the motor rotor, or sorry, the multi-rotor. Um, and these are drones which use propellers to basically take off and land and to, 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 to move. Uh, I've given you some photos of some quadcopter drones here because they're very well used now. They're quite cheap and they're quite easy to, 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 um, to, to, to use. Uh, but then we also have the fixed wing drones, which look a lot more like an aircraft. So they have proper fixed wings, as the name would suggest. Um, and then we have a hybrid type of drone, which has both propellers and fixed wings. And they use the propellers to take off and land, and then they use the, the wings to, to navigate. So there's a huge number of considerations when you're actually looking for a drone to purchase. And then moving on to some of the main components of drones. So this is, a, again, a quadcopter drone here. Um, we have the propellers and we have the motors, which make the propellers work. We then have the main body of the drone, and that contains all of the important parts. So you have a GPS module, which is to help navigate uh, you have a transmitter and a receiver in that main body, and you usually have what's called a flight controller, which is essentially the brain of the drone. Um, and then two important components. One is the power supply. So you need to make sure that that's fully charged before you start flying, obviously. And then the other is the camera. And I'm going to go and talk to you about different types of cameras in a second. Um, we then usually have some kind of ground control station, which is where you control the drone when it's in flight. Um, and so two, a few things you need to make sure that both your ground control station and your power supply are fully charged. You need to make sure and check that you have good GPS coverage so that you maintain control of that drone the whole time when it's in the air. Then it's always good practice to have a mobile phone fully charged available in case you need to communicate with air traffic control. <laughs> Excuse me. This is a, just a little video for you. I'm sure you've all seen drones and you've probably used them in your research, but for those who haven't, this is an example of a quadcopter drone. Um, and this is imagery taken from the Department of Environment in a study that we did collaboratively from the university with them a few years ago to try and develop population monitoring programs for seabirds there. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about the work that the DOE are doing in, um, in a minute. Okay, so on cameras, again, there's a huge range of considerations um, for which camera to use, in particular to your study site and your species. So very commonly used are visual spectrum cameras, and that's just your normal kind of color images that you would be used to seeing. And they can be really great depending on what species you're using, but they, they have limitations. So if you have a species which is very, um, contrast very weakly with their background, they actually have quite limited utility, so it'd be quite, quite difficult to detect animals sometimes in those images. If you're working in very high light conditions, or if you're working with species that nest in dense vegetation or, or in and under trees, obviously they have limited utility. In those kind of cases, other cameras such as thermal infrared cameras are really, really useful. Now these are being used more and more now for animal ecology, just because of some of the constraints that people are coming across. Um, and they're fantastic. And you can see some examples just on the right-hand side there of the same image in those two, we're using two different types of cameras there. 
But they do have their own drawbacks as well. One is that the data are very low spatial resolution quite often for some of the affordable drones that most people can actually afford. Um, you can run into issues with background heat, especially in the tropics, and that can make it very difficult to distinguish your animals from your um, habitat and background. And then if you have multiple species in your image, it's very difficult, or can be very difficult to distinguish between uh, different species in thermal, thermal imagery. So there are some drones on the market now which are capable of doing both at the same time. So you get both streams of data, which are really cool. Uh, and then there's loads of really, really niche um, specialist cameras that are out there that start to get quite expensive. And I don't really have time to go into them, but I'm sure Surge will be able to answer questions if you have any specific um, questions about those more advanced cameras. Another consideration is whether you go to, to collect still images or whether you use video data. And I've just given you two examples on this slide here to show on the left hand side, you have the still images and on the right hand side, you have the video. The top is one of Serge's data sets, which um, is for a spider monkey. He's going to show you more on this later, but you can see in that video as it's playing, that immediately as the animals start to move, it really draws your eye to them. So it's another form of data that can help you to collect robust um, population estimates. And in the bottom, we have another example of brown pelican data. So it's a brown pelican rookery, this time in Puerto Rico, provided by Adriana Tosas and, and the University of Puerto Rico. And you can see as you go around the colony here, you're getting lots of different angles, viewpoints from lots of different angles. So it can just help, especially when you're working with birds that nest in trees and high vegetation at different heights. Okay, so moving on, why do we want to use drones or why are drones useful for surveying seabirds? The first is that they can be a very cost-effective method for, for undertaking surveys. Um, firstly, they can reduce the manpower that's needed to gain population estimates. And secondly, they can drastically re reduce the time requirements of actually surveying populations. So it's a really, really useful tool as an advantage to, sorry, as an alternative to the more traditional survey methods that we're used to using, such as your walk-in counts. And then it, uh, associated with that, it can minimize disturbance hugely. So instead of having large teams, going in and getting close to animals so that you can get robust count data, such as in the photo you see here, you're able to actually view the animals from, from, from afar and just have a drone going in to collect your data. And also it allows you to access inaccessible areas that before now were, were just not available to us. Secondly, they allow you to collect huge amounts of data. So we're generating huge data, um, huge data sets, and we're also generating data that are a permanent data record. So we have those on file, hopefully backed up somewhere, as long as you're careful. And then we can go back in the, in the future and we can compare future surveys to our past data. So they're always there, they're permanent. In addition to this, we're able to not collect just one stream of data, but we're able to collect multiple streams. So we gain information on habitat and we can do things like produce habitat maps and understand the preference of habitats of different species, which as I'm sure you're all aware is really important for any conservation strategies. Okay, so moving on to different groups of seabirds and whether drones are an appropriate monitoring tool for them, because there are different considerations based on the species and the habitat you're working in. I'm going to talk about open ground nesting species first because they're the easiest. Um, so this includes many species of terns that we have in the Caribbean, noddies, some gulls, and also some of the boobies that we have nesting in this region um, of the world. Uh, and here drones have a really high utility. So they can be really useful for these open species which nest um, in environments where it's very easy to see them. Um, the example that you can see that I've given here is some of the work that we're doing here in the Turks and Caicos Islands at the moment on, on the offshore islands here. And the two images that you can see on the left-hand side are photos that I took uh, on foot when we were doing ground counts of royal terns and cabot's terns in a small population that we have. Um, and the images that you're going to see on the right hand side are some of the images that we've taken from our drone that was flying over the colony on the same day that we did the counts on the ground. And so we've now got these two types of data that we're in the process of comparing to see how 
uh, similar our camps are using drones versus using our ground approaches. This next slide shows you another example, but this time in the Cayman Islands for some of the work that we did led by the Department of Environment there to try and get an idea of the population size of the brown boobies that nest there. Again, you've got the photos on the left-hand side taken on foot of the nests. And on the right, you can see an image, an example image of one of our drones. And you can see quite clearly, it's quite easy from these data to count the birds that are set on the nest. Okay, so moving on, we've then got a group of seabirds which nest in trees or in other forms of vegetation, so that we call them the arboreal seabirds. And this includes in the, in the Caribbean, frigate birds, pelicans, red-footed boobies, cormorants, and some noddies will nest in vegetation as well. And as I'm sure you can imagine, if you've not done any ground surveys in mangroves, it's incredibly difficult traipsing through mangroves on your hands and your feet, um, getting covered in scratches, trying to count these birds from underneath the trees. And you can be half a meter away from a nest and not be able to see it just because of the angle that you're stood at. So here, drones are incredibly useful. And the image that I've given you here is an example, again, is some work led by the Department of Environment in the Cayman Islands that we did uh, at the uh, Little Cayman population of magnificent frigate birds and red-footed boobies. And I wanted to show this image because it's a really good example as well of how the, the, the ability to detect species can vary hugely between um, species and based on their plumage and their coloration, or even between sexes. So for the magnificent frigate birds, the males are quite easy to detect because of their big red gula sac that you, that you see on their throat. So we're getting now into the more complex groups of seabirds that can be a bit of a pain to monitor with drones or on foot. And the next is the shrub nesting species. So these are seabirds that decide to hunker down under vegetation or very close to vegetation. And it includes the sooty terns, species like bridal terns, brown noddies again, and sometimes laughing gulls. Um, the photos I've given you just show you some examples of, of the work we're doing again here in the Turks and Caicos Islands. And on the bottom, you can see some sooty tern nesting habitat. Now this species decides quite often to nest in these huge belts of cactus and prickly pear. And it's no joke trying to traverse through this habitat on foot. I still have scars all over my, my legs from, from our efforts last year. Um, and you can be centimeters away and from a bird and not be able to see it. So it's also a, a bit of a um, consideration in terms of disturbance if you're going into these environments. Um, so, but as you can imagine, drones may seem like a really good alternative, but if you're using visual spectrum cameras, that also is pretty useless because you're not going to see much. And so here is where thermal imagery really holds its own and is starting to be uh, picked up and used as a method um, throughout the world, not just for seabirds. So we're going to start testing it out here. And I know there's other people in the Caribbean that are looking into this and starting to use thermal drones as well. And I've given you an example on the screen of a thermal image, again, from some of um, Surgeon Epic's work uh, in, in Grenada. So he's going to talk to you about that in a minute. Um, the photos you're going to see on the screen here, again, just give you another example of tern breeding habitat in a very grassy area. And that's an example photo of an egg. And you can see how it's just tucked right in under the grass. And we've been doing some work on the ground to try and see how many birds we can see from a vantage point versus how many birds are actually in a certain grid area. And we're finding huge differences between what we see from a little distance versus what we see when we do a detailed search within our grids. Um, so it's drones are just great to get around these issues. Another group are the burrow crevice nesting species. So this includes the Audubon shearwaters and species of tropic birds in the Caribbean. And you either get birds sitting in potholes or little crevices, um, or you get them really nestled in, in cave systems in the bedrock. And here drones have limited utility, um, especially if they're really deep, deep into the rock. So we had a drone webinar a couple of weeks ago about acoustic methods for detecting seabirds and for these, these group of, of birds and acoustic methods are very good. However, drones can be used in some instances. And I've shown you a little map on the screen 
screen here of uh, an example of a, a study on black vented shear waters in Mexico. And it worked really well for this species because you can actually detect the burrow entrances rather than the birds from drone imagery. So there is potential as well to use drones in these instances. And then we have cliff, a cliff nesting species such as tropic birds. Um, and here drones are being used in some cases in a horizontal context, we're getting horizontal imagery um, just to, to try and monitor nests. And this is a video from some work, again, that the University of Puerto Rico are doing on the white-tailed tropic birds there with drones. So lots of varied uses for studying seabirds. Okay, so just the last section I'm gonna talk about before moving on to, to pass you over to Serge. Um, maybe slightly more boring, but it's incredibly important, and that is safety and training. So if you're sitting here and you're not used to using drones and you're thinking this would be a great technique for my seabird population and you want to get into it, you need to be aware of, 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 of good flight practice. It's absolutely essential. Um, so the first thing to be aware of is what your local flight regulations are and what is required in terms of permissions to access the sites that you're interested in surveying or to get close to the species and approach the species that you're interested in. And unfortunately, or not unfortunately, but this does vary hugely country by country. It varies with the type of drone that you plan on flying and it varies with the nature of your flight. So whether you're in an urban area where you have considerations, people and building considerations, or whether you're in a really remote area, the regulations can be quite varied. Um, so what we advise is that you contact your local aviation authority and you find out exactly what is needed in your country. And it's always a really good um, practice to make sure when you get into it, that you start learning with somebody that knows what they're doing. So some practical flight experience with somebody who's trained is really a really, really good idea. And there are a huge number of online courses that you can do now to take theory exams so that you're aware of all of your considerations when you're when you're flying drones and you can get proper certifications which are actually needed in some countries so just make sure that you go and you check with your local aviation authority however there are some generalities across countries one of the big ones being if you have a pilot that's flying a drone it's really really good and almost essential to have other people that are with you who can act as your observers and your spotters to watch for any hazards once your drone is when your drone is taking off but when it's in flight the whole time so that you're conducting your flights safely and you need to be also very sensitive and considerate of the general public and any privacy issues that need to be um, thought about across different um, aviation authorities you're going to find that they will require some form of good record keeping um, just in case anything goes wrong uh, and this requires usually a pre-site assessment, on-site assessment forms to be filled out, and then making sure that you conduct your pre-flight safety checks, which will include um, assessing any potential hazards or obstructions at your site, being aware of any restricted flight areas, for example, are you near any airports, where are the public access points that are near you, are there any buildings, cables, livestock that you need to consider, and then once you've gone through all that, you need to make sure that you have all of your necessary health and safety equipment on hand. And two-way communications are really, really important. Once we've done all that, you can check through your aircraft, your controller and your battery supply to make sure that everything's good to go. And then really, really important, also do a weather check. So the wind direction, the wind speed and the wind stability are all going to affect how your drone performs when it's in the air. So you really need to understand how that works and how it's going to affect your drone as it's moving. And then if you're working in any urban area, generally there's a need to communicate with air traffic control, especially if you're near airports. So quite often you will need to call to request takeoff clearance from them in case there's any other um, flights that are taking place nearby. And then last but not least, you need to know your emergency procedures just in case anything goes wrong, which hopefully it won't. On this screen, I've just given you a list of some of the web pages for some of the international and regional aviation authorities, um, but it's not a complete list. So please just get on Google and figure out who your national authority, aviation authority is, if you're going to get into this and you haven't done it before. OK, so enough on safety. And the last thing I'm going to mention quickly is disturbance to the animals. And this is a really, really important consideration when we're working 
close to or with any wildlife, as I'm sure you're all highly aware. So any new aerial object near a seabird can be perceived as a threat by your seabird colony um, and can be perceived as an aerial predator. And seabirds can respond to drones in a range of different ways. Um, some of the disturbance effects that have been noted include disruption of behaviors, such as foraging event or roosting. Um, it can cause stress to birds in certain instances that aren't immediately visible. So increasing elevated or elevated stress hormones, there's studies which have shown that in some instances. Um, in extreme instances, there's a, obviously a risk of injury to the animals if you're flying a drone near a bird and it reacts negatively. Um, and then if you're working in especially highly dense colonies and they flush as a response to the drone, there's obviously a risk of damage to eggs. And in extreme conditions, there's a risk of their animals actually deserting their nest or their chick. So those are all potentials. Um, but it does vary hugely between species. It varies hugely between different life stages, whether you're working on breeding adults or non-breeding adults, or even young birds. Um, the breeding stage, are they actively breeding or is it during the non-breeding period? And then it varies with the type of drone that you're using. Um, it varies with the flight technique that you're using and it varies between location. So what you need to do if you're if you're working in a new area, what we recommend that you do is you just proceed with caution. Um, the first thing to do would be to measure disturbance. So when you start your first drone flight, approach with caution, approach from the side. That seems to, some studies have suggested that that seems, if you're going to have any big changes in elevation, um, it's good to sort of take off away from your colony, not close to the colony or not right in the colony. Um, and also, if you're starting, start high. So start high and just see how the birds respond within your height range that you're allowed to fly within. And then if there's no response, you can drop your height slightly. Um, a range of studies have suggested that as a rule of thumb, a height of around 50 meters seems to be the lowest that is recommended. But again, it depends on location and species. So just proceed with caution and try and minimize your disturbance. But the take home message from all this is, would the disturbance actually be less using drone technologies than if you're using a traditional ground survey where you have a big team walking into the colony close to the birds. So it's all relative and just proceed with caution. I'm just gonna skip through this video for time. Okay, so I'm gonna pass over to Serge in a second and he's gonna to talk to you now about what to do, some of his case studies, but also what to do with the data once they're collected. Um, just briefly before, I wanted to show you one slide, again, from the work that we did with the Cayman Islands Department of the Environment at the um, Magnificent Frigate Bird and Booby Colony there, because it's a really cool study and they put a lot of effort into developing this drone survey that they now do on a, on a yearly or um, a, a, a bi-yearly basis there to monitor the population. Um, we collected two streams of data there, and the first was to go through and map the colony on foot, which required weeks and weeks of manpower to do transects and run transects through the, um, the colony. And then we were able to fly the drone at the same time as ground-based teams went through and counted birds underneath the foliage. And then we did a huge study to compare the counts from those two different methodologies. And the DOE have continued with the study in the last few years, and they've been developing their methodologies. Um, and what, 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 what they found is that actually it's, 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 it's habitat dependent, but they found that the, the, the counts that they're getting from the drone data are generally higher, as you would expect, than when the, the, the people are walking through undertaking transacts from the ground. So it does show that it's a really amazing method in, in some instances. Okay, so I'm gonna now pass on to Serge. We're just gonna quickly um, change screens so that he can he can um, be in control and thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you, Rion. That was that was great. Can you hear me? <clears throat> I hope so. Um, yes, we so can. I'm, great. Um, I'm gonna continue where Rion ended and 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 talk a little bit about these comparisons between various uh, methods ground counts, uh, sort of traditional methods with, with drone counts. And, and I 
as um, Lisa already mentioned, do most of my work with uh, primates. So I'm going to start with an, an example of orangutans, which which occur on on two islands in Southeast Asia, Sumatra, and you can see in this image the island of Borneo, where um, Sol Milner led some work where he compared ground counts of the nests that orangutans make with counts from uh, a drone. And um, orangutans, like all the other great apes, make nests, but very differently from birds. They don't use them uh, to, to breed in, they use them as sleeping platforms. So they sleep in them at night and then make a new nest the next day. And that provides information on, on where they are and how many of them there are. So our, we wanted to, to try to determine whether the counts from the trees, uh, from the drone, would be similar to the counts uh, from the ground. And if you then compare the drone survey counts to the counts from the ground, there's no statistical difference. But what is important to remember is that none of these surveys is perfect. With the drone surveys, we will miss some nests that are lower down in the canopy. With the ground surveys, we'll miss some of the nests that are really high up <clears throat> and, and difficult to see. So with both methods, we need some sort of correction factor to, to get to the, 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 the true number of, of nests. So it's important to keep that in mind that in, in many cases, drones will not give you a, a perfect answer. <clears throat> the second answer is, the uh, second uh, example is on spider monkeys. And um, this is an example where, where we worked with Denise Spahn in, in, in Mexico and, and, and uh, a few other researchers there and tried to see if thermal really helps to uh, detect the spider monkeys. And as you can appreciate in the image on the left with the optical lens, is that it's very difficult to, to see any primate in there. But if you go and look at the thermal data, you immediately see the spider monkeys as bright um, yellowish uh, dots jumping around. Um, so here we had observers under the trees that were counting the spider monkeys from underneath. And we had people uh, that were later on independently counting <clears throat> the amount number of spider monkeys on the drone data. And um, very similar to uh, the results with orangutans, we, we found not too many differences when the groups were small, but we found that you can see more spider monkeys when the groups are large. And this is probably because some of them will be really high up, which makes it then very difficult to see from, from underneath. So if you look at it in a, in a, in a figure, so on the, with the small subgroups, most of the ground and drone counts agreed. So there was a zero difference. But with the large subgroups, the drone data had, had larger numbers than the ground data. So here, for larger groups, the drones probably give an advantage over um, counting from the ground and will therefore give you a more accurate count of the animals that are uh, there. <clears throat> but one of the amazing advantages of, of drones is also at the same time a disadvantage. What Rianon said is that you, you collect this permanent record, you collect all these images, which is wonderful because you can compare between, between surveys, but it also leads to a huge amount uh, of images. For example, if we, if we fly uh, a drone for an hour and we take a photo every two seconds, then we have 1800 photos in an hour. It will take me about a minute to check on a photo, whether there's a orangutan nest in it. So if I have to do that for 1800 
photos, that will take me 30 hours, which is, which is very inefficient. Um, then it's probably more efficient to just walk in the forest, count them, and then, then, then you're done. So what can we do to, to help with that? So we can, can, can we automate counts of, of nests and of animals in, in, in drone images? Because if we, if we can do that, then drones, I think, will become very, very efficient. So we've recently started a, um, a project to, to do this, which is called Conservation AI. And it's a collaboration between computer scientists, astrophysicists, and conservation biologists like myself. And the aim is to, to try to automate detection of animals in uh, stills and, 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 and videos. And we, we try to do that not only for images from drones, but also from camera traps, because it's essentially the same problem, and also a little bit from acoustic sensors, uh, which people are also increasingly using. And machine learning can also help to, to detect whether an, an animal has made a sound. So let's, let's look at, at the uh, orangutan nests. Can we detect them? So to, to reach a detection, which you can see in this uh, example, the algorithm detected the nest and has a 74% probability that it is indeed a nest. <clears throat> um, another image, a little bit further away, uh, there's a 63% probability that it is a nest, but as you can see as well, the algorithm is not perfect by any means. There's a nest here, there's a nest here as well, and there's one here as well. So it's still missing a few, but we're still training this. So we have to develop a lot of training data where we look at these images, we draw a box around it, and then tell the algorithm, this is a nest. Once we've done that enough, once we have done that enough with images where nests are photographed from different angles, then um, the algorithm will hopefully be good enough to detect them very reliably. We've also uh, worked on this uh, to automate detection of the spider monkeys, but then with thermal infrared data. So here we fly over the area in, in Mexico and the spider monkeys are automatically detected. Um, and this really helps to, to, to count them. In this example with the spider monkeys, there's not too many, but if you look at this example from uh, the Arabian Oryx in <clears throat> the Middle East, you can see that there's a large uh, number and as the drone approaches them, so as the Oryx has become larger in the image, the drone starts to detect them. So there is a sort of, in, in this case, the drone needs to be, the, the object needs to have a certain amount of pixels before it can be detected, but it picks up almost all of them, which is, is, is very promising. But as Rhiannon already said, with the thermal data, the resolution is a lot lower than with optical data. So it's more difficult to differentiate uh, species than it is with, with optical data. <clears throat> so let's move back to birds. Now, so I've, I've been working with, with Epic uh, in, in Granada a couple of months ago to, to look at, at birds on some of the islands there. And, and, and one of the things that, that we tried to do is to use the drone to fly a, a grid over the whole island or, or part of it, and then develop uh, an ortho mosaic where essentially you use software uh, to mosaic the images together in, in one large image. And you can use Fix4D, uh, Agisoc, WebODM. There's a couple of software packages out there, some free, some you have to pay for to do this. But the, the advantage is that you get a much higher resolution uh, data uh, set than the satellite data. So you can really look at habitats um, in a much more detailed way and, and distinguish vegetation types, which can be important to reach estimates for, uh, for, for 
birds in, in a particular place. So this is uh, uh, where uh, Baradal Island, uh, where we map the whole island. So here you can um, actually see the whole island that we mapped and you can see a lot of um, detail on this image where we where we zoomed in a little bit. So this is really a nice way to, to get this high resolution uh, map that you can overlay with other layers in, in, in GIS packages. You can also, from the 2D images, you can make a three-dimensional map. And that's what we've done here. This is again uh, Baradal. And this is where I just uh, animated a, a fly around the a flight around the island in pix 4 d uh, mapper software. So you can really from and uh, again I find it still amazing. These are all images taken straight down from the drone. But the, the software makes a three-dimensional representation from it. And again that's very useful if you want to understand a little bit more about how the habitat is distributed over an island, how the birds are potentially distributed over an island. It gives you a lot of, of information <clears throat> to, to work with when you're trying to understand the ecology of, of uh, species. Um, but as was said earlier, birds are very difficult to, to detect. Here there are some small birds that are very difficult to see. Here there's um, some, some noddies in this image, which the noddy is here again, which is quite difficult. What was quite funny here was that we from the ground already spotted that there was an iguana here, but we could also see it from the air. Here, when we zoom in, you can see it a little bit better. The iguana is here and the bird is there. Um, so it is possible to count them here, but I think in this particular case, automating this will, will be quite hard, but it's something that uh, we're interested in trying to see if we can do that. With thermal data, this, this is the same habitat as I, as I showed you in the previous slide. <clears throat> it becomes a bit easier to at least detect the birds. So you can see the birds in their nests, in, in the vegetation. So this was a flight that was done at, I think, five o'clock in the morning. So when you do thermal work, mornings are usually the best time to fly because the, the vegetation is then very cold or as cold as it's going to get. And particularly, as was said earlier as well, in the tropics, the, the vegetation can become very warm and then it's more difficult to, to distinguish the animals from the background, and particularly with birds that are very well insulated, this can be challenging. So this is just another example <clears throat> where you can see the birds uh, quite clearly on image. And this is a little bit of a video where I'm not flying too much around. But as Rihanna also said, with video, it often becomes easier to detect uh, the animals, and in this case, the birds, because you look a little bit from different angles, and if they move, it also becomes easier, like it's happening uh, here, but they quickly uh, land again. Um, so thermal uh, works quite well for uh, some cases and some birds, but it can also lead to quite surprising results. So this is an image where the birds are actually colder than the background. So the birds are the very dark blue dots. So you can essentially count them in the image, but the background is warmer than the birds. And that's probably due to the fact that the, these birds are very well insulated. So, and you would, you would potentially, if you had a very high resolution camera, then you would see their head probably as being warm, but 
the rest of the body would show up much uh, colder because of the insulation. So here it's really difficult to, to it, it is quite difficult to see them. But again, I think here automation could work to detect them. So that's for us in with the Burke research, really the next step is try to see what we can do to actually at least count the birds in um, these images. It will not be possible with only thermal <clears throat> on an image like this to distinguish the various bird species because there's just not enough information to do that. And I think with that, I hand over to Rihanna again. Yeah, I'm back. Let me just share my screen. Um, that's not the slide I wanted. Sorry, everyone. <clears throat> so let's see if this works. OK. Um, can you see me? I can't see myself, so. Yes, we can see you, but we're not seeing your screen yet. Oh, you're not? OK, that's a shame. Uh, uh, uh. Let's try again. OK, so I'm just going to quickly, how much time do we have left? We are, OK, so we don't have long. So we're going to do a question, quick question and answer thing so you guys can get involved with a bit of fun public participation at the end. Um, I just wanted to run over this slide quickly, which was just to say there are some other considerations when you're analysing your data, such as standardisation. So obviously the, the counts are going to vary between people. Um, so there's various tests that you can do to see just, just to do to just see how variable your counts are between people. And that's an important consideration. Um, obviously, there's a huge time requirement still to analyze the data, as, as Serge has just said. But then you also need to think about detectability and how that can vary between different plumage morphs. Um, so, for example, this image here is another example from the population in the Cayman Islands. And you can see the bird in the center is a white morph red-footed booby, while the rest are brown brown morphs. So those are other considerations that you need to really think about how to account for that in your data. And it can also vary with different life stages um, and different sexes, as we've already seen with the frigate birds. And then lastly, data storage requirements, backing up your data is key. And we have another webinar, which we're going to be doing in a few weeks, which is about data handling. So we'll cover that in the next webinar because we're quite short in time now. OK, so we're going to do a quick um, question and answer thing if you're still with us. And um, Lisa is going to put up a poll. And so what we want you to do, this is an example image of uh, taken from a drone of brown boobies in the Cayman Islands. And we want you to try and see how many birds you can see in the image. Is it A, 0, B, 3, C, 5 or D, 12? And we're going to give you 30 seconds going from now. And I want you to, a screen's popped up. And I want you to log your answer on the poll that should, should have popped up on your screen. You might need to move it out of the way of your image. And when most people have answered, then we will reveal the answer. Okay, answers are coming in. Good job, everybody. We'll give you a few more seconds to examine the photo and get your answer in. We'll see how well you do. This one's just to get your eye in because we've got a few more complicated ones coming in a minute. Yes, give it a go. This isn't for marks. We won't be grading you. Oh, no, you seem to have got <laughs> the answer already. How did that happen? <laughs> okay, okay. So we're seeing I've already revealed it. <laughs> and here you go. Here's how everybody did. Can you see how everybody did? 46% said three, 46% said five. Okay, so we've actually got three. So, and that, and you can see from the zoom, and obviously if you were analyzing these data, you'd be able to zoom into each image, but you can see when you zoom really close into the image, you can see those birds really, really clearly on the ground. So it's a really good example of how it works with open nesting species. 
Okay, let's move on to the next one. I don't know. Oh, Lisa, can you bring up the poll again? This is yeah. some neotropical cormorants in the Turks and Caicos Islands, and we want you to guess, based on those four different numbers, how many birds you think are in this image. This one is definitely more challenging, Rhiannon. Yeah, I know. You know it, it's just, it's also, um, this is a roost, so they don't, they're not nest, they're not on nests, these birds, and this is outside of the breeding season. So it's um, we have lots of things to contend with. And this is a good example as well of how glare and light can really affect your ability to see birds in images. Because when you, especially when you have water um nearby or whether it's really, really high light levels, you can get some significant glare. And you have to sometimes consider using filters to try and screen, filter some of that out as well, just to improve the quality of your imagery. So it does take a little bit of trial and error at your different sites and thinking about where the sun is and what time of day you're going to undertake your flight as well is really important. Yeah, those birds really blend into the rocks as well. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a big task. <laughs> So it's a lot of birds. To... You'll have to make an estimate because it'd be very difficult to count. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Just a four point figure. All right. Three more seconds to get your answer in. Give it a go. See how we do. Three, two, one. All right. Let's see how they did. Okay. okay. So 41% said there were 36 birds, 37% said 48, and 22% said 52. So what is the real answer? Oh, a real answer is 49. Uh -huh. That wasn't, was that, was that even, <laughs> was that on uh, the multiple yeah. choice? I think we're missing one from each. So whoever answered 48, we can uh, take that okay. as the correct answer. <laughs> but you can see the red dots. There's actually a lot more than it initially looks when you, when you're looking at the image just quickly. So you really have to zoom in and really really look carefully but again thermal here would probably allow us to, to to really hopefully distinguish between those birds from the background okay so next question is how many turns can you see in this image so again this is in a um a prickly pear grass habitat so these are sooty turns if there's actually any there Another challenging one. For those of you that are watching the screen, you already know the answer. <laughs> All right, answers are coming in. Good job, you guys. We'll give you five more seconds. Take your best guess, best estimate. Sorry, my screen's just moving by itself. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that might be me. That might be me. I got it. Okay. It's because there's multiple cooks. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the, most people said 12. Um, these are the results. So how'd they do? Yes. So 12. But actually, there's about four times the number of birds in that image than you can see with the drone, which we know from also doing ground transects. So um it's uh it may seem like there's few birds but most of them are just hidden under the vegetation which we've already talked about as a constraint so okay uh i'm gonna skip over this one but we're gonna go straight to the thermal just for time so this is an example of thermal imagery um from serge's work and want you to firstly ask how many questions uh, how many animals or birds can you count in this image 11, 21, 23, or 34. Well, you guys are fast counters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, answers are coming in. We'll give you a few more seconds to get your count done. Looking good. All right, five, four, three, two, one. And let's see, here's what people said. Uh, most people thought there were 23 animals. Some people thought there were more, some less. So 
I counted 21 and the answer is we're not sure. <laughs> so it may be 23. Um, and there's a few highlighted areas in the image where it could be a bird or it may not be. So there's a little bit of uncertainty. Um, but yeah, I counted 21 and those are the ones that you can see circled. So maybe people have found a few others that could be birds as well. Sorry, Lisa, you say something. No, oh, sorry. No. Okay. And then last last question. So same image. How many different species do you can you count in this image? So of those that have been circled, red, how many, how many different species? One, two, three, or more than three. Yeah, is it a big blob or a little blob or a medium blob? All right, most people are answered. Yeah, we'll give you a few more seconds. Let us know what you think. How many different size blobs can you see? All right, five, four, three, two, one. And okay. that's what everybody guessed. Most people thought there were three. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's again and again, it's a trick question because we don't know. And that's just to demonstrate an example of some of the constraints of thermal imagery um, because we can't tell. This, uh, such um, collected these data during nighttime. But to me, it looks like there's two different sizes of birds in the image, at least. So I put I put two, I thought two, but it could be it could be anything from one to three, maybe even more. So this is where these cameras that have both streams of imagery can be really really useful and powerful. Um, so yeah, thank you. Just to give you a bit of a a taste of what it's like to analyze these images, and it's quite fun to do it a few times. But when you get to photo one hundred and twenty four, your eyes start going a bit blurry. So it's when it's good to, to, to start trying to chat to Serge and get into some of these more automated approaches. It really speeds things up. Um, okay, so I think that's about it really. We just wanted to open it up to questions. If anyone's around still can hang on for a few minutes. Um, we're available. I see that there's a bunch of questions that have come through on the chat already and I've been trying to answer some of them as we go. Um, I don't know how you want to do this, Lisa. Do you want to run this question and question session and then we can see how we go and Serge can jump in um, and I can jump in as and when, depending on the question. Sure, yeah, I can um, read the questions for you. I know one person, uh, a couple of people asked about getting a copy of the presentation and we will get this up on our YouTube channel in the next day or two. And um, we have a Seabird webinar playlist. So I've just put, put the link there in the chat. And um, Rhiannon and Serge, would you be willing to share um, a PDF or, or this PowerPoint so people can have reference to it and, and use it? Yeah, to of course. Them? Yeah, that's no great. problem. That's great. Okay, so we we'll send a message out to everybody um, with a link to download it from like Google Drive or something. Great. Perfect. Okay. So um, one question from Sarah is, do you have an overall recommendation of what drone works best for research? or brand and drone specifications will depend on the species and purpose of the research? Serge, I'm gonna let yeah. you answer that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> it, it so much depends on, on exactly what you want to do. I mean, G, DGI um, is, is the brand that, that many people uh, use for, for multi-rotors. There's an, a US-based company, Auto, which is also uh, being used. Um, they have sort of similar kinds uh, types of systems. Um, but if you want to cover large areas, then fixed wings are, are probably uh, better, but uh, they have the disadvantage that you need a larger space to land. So then these hybrid models become in play, but they're very costly. Uh, Wingtra is one of the companies that sells them, but they will probably cost around 20,000 US. Dollars, so that, that's a that's a, a yeah large amount of money. <clears throat> so it, it really depends on what you want to do. And in 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 general, 
my recommendation would be to first try something that's not so costly and see whether you can get what you need. So if you can, if you only need optical data, try a, a, a small DJI Mavic system and, and see if it works for you. And then if, if that works and you get the images that you, then you need, then maybe invest in a, in a, in a more uh, expensive system. Or if you know someone that has a drone that can come out and, and do the flights, that's sometimes also an, an option before you invest in a very costly system yourself. Um, but if, yeah, if you, you can either write me or, or, uh, or uh, others, I think. And if you have a particular habitat and a particular species that you want to study in a particular question, then I'm happy to email about that and give you more, more, more thoughts and more specific uh, advice. But um, it, it, really, it really is quite research dependent and species dependent. Just to say, we we in all the projects or collaborative projects I've been involved in, we've used various models of DJI drones, but some of them are more basic ones, like the Air 2s that we're using currently here, and they're performing fantastically well um, for what we need them for, uh, for a range of different seabird species, and they're quite cheap and cheerful. So um, I sort of agree with Serge in terms of if you can try the sort of cheaper DJI is brilliant. Like I think they're sort of they're well used, aren't they? So yes, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Rhiannon, what what um, altitude do you usually fly your drones over? Um, it it, it depends on the colony and the species because some species are a little more sensitive than others. Um, and but we generally try once we've tested it at a higher height, we go around 50 meters because we, we find that, that there's kind of min that in most cases, there's minimal disturbance at that height. Um, or if the birds, for, so I think I answered this in the question chat, the question in the live chat as well. We've found that actually it's the noise of the takeoff and the landing that seems to disturb the birds or they get a little bit kind of um, rustly when you're taking off from, uh, you know, a little bit away from the colony and then they settle down. And then once the drone's moving in the air and flying flights, there seems to be, there seems to be very, very minimal disturbance at that height. So I, for me, I, I think it's maybe the noise is as, in, as, as important as the shape of the drone. Um, but but we've only, in the projects I've been involved in, we've only used the um, multi-rotor drones or the quadcopter drones. So I know there's reports of the bigger fixed wing drones having a bigger impact because they're just larger and I guess look a bit more like big aerial predators. So um, I think, but it is so, so variable depending on the species and the location. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. That's helpful. And Tony Diamond asks, is, is asking, have you had any frigates or other birds try to mob the drone? So in the frigate bird, we, we, we did a lot of, of drone work around the frigate bird colony in the Cayman Islands. And actually, I was quite surprised because when we started, I thought they would. And they were pretty uninterested in it. I don't think I saw any examples of a frigate bird mobbing the drone. One bird that I have seen approaching drones in an aggressive way is an osprey. And quite often at seabird colonies, you're going to have ospreys nearby as well. So that's something to be aware of. Ospreys don't really like them, <laughs> but I've never had a situation where it's been more than a kind of small interaction or a little bit of interest and then they, they, they leave. So there's never been a situation where we've had to land a drone because an osprey has been mobbing it. I've never seen that with any, any seabird or any other coastal bird that we've been around flying drones. So I think it's, I've, I've been, I've heard through the community that there's times when birds haven't really liked it in the past, but I think now the drones are getting smaller, quieter. Um, it, it seems to be that as long as you're very, um, you, you proceed with caution that, that they, they, and you fly at a certain height, it seems to be in most cases, there's no, there's no way, there's no, no, no cases I've heard recently where I've had to abort or colleagues have had to abort because the birds have been really disturbed. Um, but I've walked into colonies and as soon as you land on a beach and the birds are quite far away, they don't like it and then they flush. So, you know, 
that's the that's the um the trade-off, I think. You still there, Lisa? All right. It does seem like overall a drone overhead, as long as it's at a good altitude, would be better than walking through the colony, which was exactly yeah, I think so as well. Yeah. And and but particularly now with the with the new sort of Mavic 3 series with the they have a seven time optical zoom at at 50 meters high and seven times optical zoom you get an enormous amount of detail mm -hmm. of course you when you zoom you get the smaller area that you cover with the camera but so there's a trade off but the the zoom is tremendously helpful for 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 birds and i think also to look in these situations where you have the, the prickly pear or other vegetation where you want to look a little bit under the vegetation flying with with the camera under an angle and and with the zoom and trying to peek under it will 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 help so that's also an important thing to to trial what the best camera angle is sometimes it's top down sometimes it's under an angle it depends a little bit on the on the vegetation and, and where the birds are, but what the, the best setting is. And then you can play around with the zoom and then hopefully come to, to a combination that, that, that works. Uh, but I think the zoom for, for birds is a tremendous benefit. Uh, at least when we were, uh, were flying on the recent trip, it really helped to, uh, to find uh, the, the birds. Unfortunately, that's not available yet for thermal. But um, we'll, we'll see how, uh, whether the thermal resolution will increase or not. Okay, super. Uh, so Tony Diamond said, rob the drop drone, not mob. I don't know what he means by that. If a drone would try to, if a <coughs> would try to steal a drone, uh, maybe he has some experience with that. Do you? <laughs> No, we've never. I, I, we have had some large eagles follow fixed wings in in Africa, and mm -hmm. then in one case we did land, um, just as a as a precaution. Um, and yeah, as Rhiannon said, during takeoff and landing, those are the times that also some some of the nuddies would would fly pretty close to a, to a to the drone and and very fast uh, along it, which is a bit scary. They probably wouldn't bump into it, but you 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 never know. And uh, you don't want to damage birds or, or or drones. So then those are the critical times and 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 it's best to to take off and land far away from, from where the birds are to to avoid those kind of issues. Tony said rob, not mob. Yes. I meant trying to rob like they rob other birds of their food. Um Maybe men mob. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. We're we're uh, running out of time, but uh, one more question. So um, I'm very interested in surveying and monitoring waterbirds. We have a Caribbean waterbird census, which many um, of our partners are active in um, throughout the year, and especially in the winter time during our regional count period. And of course, it can be very challenging to count waterbirds as well. So just wondering. Obviously, you're working in habitats where you sea herons and egrets and shorebirds as well. Do you have any comments on how they react to the drone? And, um, you know, how do you think it would be possible to use a drone to do more surveys of these birds, which can also be in the mangroves and very hard to reach and count? So we recently, um, we did some uh, trialing of drones with, um, with some shorebirds um, with the RSPB out here. And um, we've got some really cool data, but I I think they may be more, I don't I don't have any quantitative data, but I I do wonder if they would be more sensitive to flushing. Um, so I think again, it's I think it has potential definitely to to, to collect data for, for waders and shorebirds. Um, I'm sure there's people doing it all over the place, 
um, not all over the place. I'm sure there's people doing it. I know there are published studies for, for Shorebird. Um, Serge probably knows more than me about that, but I know they are used for that purpose. Great. Yes, Thanks. they they're definitely used for that, and 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 and, and uh, you can you can yeah email uh, email me and I'll I'll can get some publications out if you like. Um, but I think think the flushing is indeed a, a key aspect there. So it's flying high enough, and 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 maybe they flush a few times and then and then get used to it. So it, it's that's a possibility as well. So it, it kind of depends if you're in an area for multiple days. I think you they they will probably get used to it after a couple of flights. And if you're if 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 that's okay with with uh what you're trying to do then then and then that drone might work. And again with with the zoom I think we have much better options to fly high and and, and still get the data we need and really minimize the the, the flushing uh, or and other disturbance. So I think that that it is should certainly be be possible. That's great. All right. Well, thank you so much to Rhiannon and Serge for this outstanding webinar. Um, I learned so much. I'm sure everybody else did as well.